Días, eh, gracias por acompañarnos en este cuarto día de trabajos intensos en el segundo congreso de patrimonio cultural y nuevas tecnologías. Eh, la jornada de hoy está dedicada a temas relacionados con la arqueología y nos da mucho gusto poder presentar a, a Kiara Bonaki, quien será nuestra presentadora magistral del día de hoy. Eh, Kiara tiene estudios doctorales en la Universidad, en el University College of London, UCL y ha dedicado gran parte de su trabajo al tema de la arqueología pública. Eh, creo que es un tema poco tratado dentro de nuestra comunidad en México y por eso nos pareció muy pertinente invitarla a, a compartir su experiencia en la investigación eh, vinculando la arqueología pública, el estudio de museos y del patrimonio cultural. Eh, sin duda creo que es una gran oportunidad para conocer su trabajo y, e iniciar eh, líneas de investigación en este sentido en México. Así que sin más preámbulo, eh, los dejo con Chiara Bonaki. Eh, thank you very much, Chiara. Now, Efraín is going to do a little adjustment. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ernesto, uh, for this introduction. Um, and buenos dias. Uh, I'm afraid that sadly my ability to speak in Spanish doesn't go very far, so um, I will have to speak in English, and I apologize uh, for this. Before starting, um, I would really like to thank uh, the organizers of the Congress um, and uh, the Institute, INA, for inviting me to be part to uh, what I have found really interesting, um, rich and varied discussion about the role uh, of new technologies in and for cultural heritage, and for giving me the opportunity to connect um, with you all, uh, with a network of people based in Mexico and other countries as well, who are interested in some of the issues um, and um, some of the themes that I'm also very interested in. So thank you. Today's session will focus on the use of digital media uh, in archaeology, uh, how um, digital technologies uh, can really help um, and can support uh, archaeological research, how they can support the preservation of archaeological heritage, uh, and how they can support um, what um, in Spanish um, you called very effectively the socialization of uh, archaeology, so the social use of archaeology. Importantly, uh, digital technologies can also help to make the process of archaeological research and the practice of public engagement more tightly interlinked and mutually reinforcing. And this is the point that um, I would like to make in my talk. Um, first, through an initial uh, and more general overview, and then looking specifically at uh, a case study, uh, a project um, called Micropasts, in which I have been involved for the past two years at uh, University College London. Archaeology has a very long tradition of engaging the public as we know, which really dates back to its um, antiquarian roots, to the 18th century. Um, all around the world, archaeologists have involved um, local communities. They have leveraged a range of media, so institutional media, to communicate the methods and the results uh, of the work. What you see here um, is an image from one of the very first television shows to be broadcasted in the UK about archaeology uh, called Buried Treasure. It features Mortimer Wheeler, uh, who's not only one really important uh, archaeologist, one of the founding fathers, um, perhaps, of the archaeological method, but also uh, an incredible, a fantastic communicator who used uh, television, magazines, and books to bring the public in what uh, he was doing. It was the 1950s, and uh, archaeology had been actually the first scientific discipline to be showed uh, on uh, the small screen in Britain. Recently, um, Carol Kulik has published a study uh, that looks at the development of archaeological communication um, 
which focuses really on the UK and um, on print, television um, and radio uh, communication. And um, in her work, she identified a number of main phases of archaeological communication that she calls ages of communication. Perhaps this expression, ages, is less than ideal, uh, I think so, um, to really express um, what the reality of change um, in the media and communication environment is. But her work is useful uh, because it really highlights um, the long, uh, this long-running uh, practice of engaging the public with um, our discipline and how far uh, it really goes back to. Her work also, and similar, um, uh, historical uh, research really prompts us to think critically and very well um, about the actual um, added value that uh, new digital media can bring um, for public engagement. What is their unique contribution to make archaeology accessible to, valuable for, and valued, and valued by um, the highest possible numbers of individuals and groups within our society. Today, um, this question is um, increasingly uh, asked and this topic is um, increasingly addressed in the field of public um, archaeology, which um, is a field that examines the relationship between um, archaeology on the one end and society on the other with the ultimate and practical aim of improving this relationship. It is um, a field that builds on um, the a tradition um, that was started in the US in the 1970s by an archaeologist called uh, Charles McJimsey and further developed in the UK during the 1990s and up to the present day. Um, now, public archaeology is a really funny, in a way, or could seem a bit of a strange expression because isn't all archaeology public? Well, yes, it is, but is it really the case every time? Is it really, um, are, are we always um, really communicating the results of our research? Are we always including or trying to include um, the public um, in, in what we're doing, making sure that um, the social value of archaeology is enhanced? So this is what uh, this um, sector um, this area of studies looks at. And um, in the past few years, um, a number of European, Mediterranean, and also other countries beyond the UK and the US um, have organized a number of initiatives, um, congresses, conference, conferences, to scope, um, to scope um, the, this field of studies and to try to frame um, this relatively recent area of, speci of specialism. And in this context, they have also explored um, the positive and transformative roles that new digital media can play to improve the manifold interactions between archaeology and the public. The public as state with its institutions, the public as the people, the public as the public opinion. Um, the public opinion that is created by people discussing about um, archaeology. What I would argue, and what um, also refers to some of the points that were made in previous days um, by Jeffrey, by Kate, um, and, and also by Peter, is that digital technologies can open up new pathways to make archaeology truly public by helping to bridge the boundaries between archaeological science methods and public archaeology methods, and by supercharging opportunities for citizen partici participation in archaeological research. These opportunities are facilitated by the open rather than closed nature of data, practices, 
um, and access that web infrastructures enable at a potentially very wide geographic scale. And it is in turn this potential openness um, to lay the basis for an unprecedented deluge of data, the diluvio to which uh, Jeffrey was referring to, to be available online to different users. However, whether digital technologies actually fuel or not participatory forms of public engagement with archaeological research, um, those indicated in blue um, in the slide, ultimately depends largely on the kinds of relationships that institutions wish and are in a position to establish with the public. And to simplify um, very much, um, I think that we could identify two main modes of digital public engagement, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive and could actually be intertwined. The first is a broadcasting mode, um, and a broadcasting mode is where messages are communicated uh, to the public, sometimes also inviting feedback, but without really engaging in the collaborative construction of meaning. Um, this mode can be enabled through institutional media um, that now um, deliver the content on multiple platforms, uh, for example, um, television available online, uh, but in fact coinciding to, coinciding to a great extent with the offline um, offering. A broadcasting mode of public engagement can also be embraced directly by museums and heritage um, organizations, uh, on occasion also in partnership with radio and television channels. This was the case of um, the example that you see on the left, um, which is a, a radio series, a history of the world in a hundred objects, which was co-produced in 2010 by the British Museum together with um, BBC Radio 4. And um, research conducted, amongst others, by Lorna Richardson uh, really show that, for example, in the UK, archaeological institutions tend to embrace this model of digital public engagement also via social media. So they are using um, so also social media um, in order to deliver messages more than also to engage uh, in dialogue with the public, so also to listen and so also listening and responding to what the public has to say. This is often the result um, of um, a fear uh, to lose authority um, and or sometimes um, due to what is the real or sometimes perceived lack of resources in terms of stuff uh, of time. Of course, some economies of scale are possible, but to only to some extent. The second mode um, of digital public engagement um, is the participatory mode that I was referring to um, at the beginning. And um, this is um, this. Um, I mean, re reflection um, and um, discussion about um, different levels of um, participatory approaches uh, has been done, for example, by Nina Simon in relation to um, museum engagement, um, and particularly through her book, The Participatory Museum, published in um, 2010. And um, in fact, uh, Nina Simon identified a number of levels of participatory um, engagement. And um, each of these methods, uh, sorry, each of these levels really requires uh, progressively more advanced, progressively more sophisticated skills uh, on the part of the public. A contributory kind uh, of participation, which you see uh, again um, on the left, asks the public to uh, help to assist with projects that have already been to a large extent um, designed by uh, institutions. Um, I have included um, the example of the Field Expedition Mongolia project, which is a project that um, invites uh, whoever is interested really online to inspect digital imagery in order to identify archaeological features. And um, this is 
um, an application of crowdsourcing. In co-creative undertakings, instead, research agendas are developed collaboratively um, with the public and projects are then run collaboratively with uh, the public. This is what happens, for example, um, for the projects that are developed and run by Dick Venters, which is a social enterprise um, that uh, develops uh, collaboratively with communities internationally, um, community uh, archaeology projects. Hosted participation is um, for example what we uh, experimented with as part of the Micropass project and um, as part of this project in fact we created uh, a crowdfunding platform, um, a space where community uh, archaeology groups together with in partnership with institutions could really raise funds for uh, their own activities. So essentially we created a space to host community archaeology projects looking for funding. And um, there are also entirely grassroots participatory projects that I think are indeed worth mentioning. A notable one is the megalithic portal. Um, I don't know if you have come across it. This is a crowdsourcing um, website that um, has been running for years and um, this explains uh, partly um, the, the fact that perhaps it does look a little bit clunky uh, in its interface. Um, and uh, the Megalithic portal is an initiative started by citizens, um, so not by a, a particular uh, institution, uh, and asks fellow citizens to um, help uh, identify, locate archaeological sites all around the world. Here I have included Mexico. And of course, uh, there has been critique over the fact that data um, ultimately is not checked, it's not uh, validated. But I think the point is really to stress um, the longevity uh, of this initiative, um, which cannot be uh, overlooked, I think, particularly at a time where um, the sustainability uh, of web infrastructures, digital resources is, um, is, is so important and, and, and so discussed, such a critical um, theme. All the examples that I've proposed so far are centered on crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, uh, just to stress how the same method um, can um, really be used to enable different levels of participatory um, engagement. And an additional point um, that is rather obvious, but perhaps worth reminding ourselves of, is that whatever the mode of public engagement that we wish to enable, in planning it, um, it is important not only to take into account some of the issues that we very well know related to, for example, the divides, a first divide relating to access to resources, a second divide relating to um, digital knowledge, digital skills, but also importantly, um, it is important to take into account the sociocultural and the policy context in which our archaeological and engagement activities take place. Some research that I did in the past really show how different um, the roles, for example, of museums and television um, are in the UK compared to Italy in um, helping people to access uh, archaeological information and how, for example, um, they are much more important uh, in Britain and instead how in Italy um, archaeological site visitation is much more widespread um, and, and this kind of uh, direct in-person visitation um, is much more important to citizens uh, than it is, for example, um, in Britain. Now, as anticipated, um, I would like to um, really stress my main point, so how digital technologies can help to make archaeological research and public engagement more uh, intertwined, more interlinked through uh, the case study of the Micropasts project. 
Micropast, um, so I will talk uh, about the project. I will discuss participant uh, behavior, profile, and motivations, and the scientific and social values that derive from the application of a public archaeology approach that is based on crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, the use of forum technologies, social media, uh, integrated on occasion also with some in person um, interactions and engagement. Crowdsourcing can be understood as the collection, the creation, the enhancement of information by individually small uh, actions uh, that are performed by relatively large groups of people online over, um, over the internet. And the neologism crowdsourcing was introduced by Jeff Howe uh, in 2006 to describe really new business practices based on the outsourcing of labor and its distribution amongst crowds of workers potentially located in very different places um, all around the world. Uh, it appeared for the first time in an article that was published uh, in, in Wired. More recently, crowdsourcing um, has been really explored in a number of different declinations and ways also uh, by um, heritage institutions internationally. Um, in the last five years in the UK, for example, um, there, there, there have been, could be counted, at least 29 new crowdsourcing initiatives um, promoted by uh, institutions. Uh, the majority started between 2010 and 2011, uh, and um, of these, um, only four uh, have actually already reached uh, formally an end. These initiatives uh, have tended to um, be um, of three possible, one of three possible kinds. So uh, we can identify three main categories. There's a first category um, of one project ventures. So crowdsourcing inventors that really focus on one project, um, achieving one objective. And um, these have been by far the majority uh, so far. The second group is that of multi-project platforms, um, and here I've included a few examples, Heritage Helpers, History Peen, Zooniverse, Micropasts as well. And um, the third category is a bit different. It includes um, initiatives that have maintained their distinct identity, but which actually um, uh, have um, been initiati initiated and supported thanks to the help of existing platforms. So for example, via, city, uh, via, help, via uh, the help through the help of the Citizen Science Alliance. Now, one of the um, multi-project um, initiatives that um, have been set up uh, in the last few years is, in fact, um, Micropasts, um, which is a collaboration between the Institute of Archaeology at uh, University College London and the British Museum. Um, it is um, sit funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, and has been running for uh, the past two years. Uh, actually, um, during um, the last year, uh, our collaborations have much expanded beyond um, these two original institutions to include more museums, more archives uh, that we've built relationships with. Um, Micropasts um, has experimented um, with the use of crowdsourcing and other web-based methods to establish um, and to study collaborations between uh, institutions, mainly museums and universities on one side, and members of the public on the other, in order to study the human past by doing one or more of three possible things. One is creating a new and open archaeological historical data through crowdsourcing. The second is um, using forum technologies in order to involve uh, collaborators, um, citizens in discussions about how these data could be used um, and also uh, to develop new tools, further develop the, plat the micropasts, platforms and the micropasts project. And finally, the third is 
um, using crowdfunding to microfinance uh, community archaeology and community um, history projects. To achieve this aim, um, we built micropasts.org, which is um, a, a platform that um, really has uh, three main web components. There is um, a crowdsourcing website um, uh, which, and a forum um, which were launched in April 2014 and there is a, crowdfund a crowdfunding website which was launched in um, October 2014. Um, and I will now uh, in this talk focus on the crowdsourcing um, component. Through um, the Micropasts uh, crowdsourcing platform, uh, members of the public can help to create uh, new and open data by contributing to um, crowdsourcing applications that we have, uh, we have developed using open source software and version control via GitHub. You see here um, a, a few uh, examples. Now, uh, the majority of the crowdsourcing applications that we have uh, deployed are research orientated. This means that um, they were developed uh, in order to um, build uh, data sets that would then allow uh, answering um, research questions that were set um, uh, to a large extent from the outset, rather than for um, digitization purposes per se. But we have also uh, developed some pop-up um, applications, um, either to test new crowdsourcing methods or to test existing crowdsourcing methods with new uh, collections. And of course, these smaller experiments have been really useful to kick off um, collaborations with new institutions because they've been a way to um, really explore the potential of using this method for them and understand what they could they could find in it, what they could get out of it. The majority of the work that we've been doing so far has revolved around the transcription of the National Bronze Age Implement Index, which is a really big paper archive that is stored at the British Museum and contains about 30,000, um, a bit more than 30,000 uh, object cards that document metal finds that were found in Britain in the 19th and 20th century. And this is an archive that was basically lost. Um, its digitization could not be funded, had been tried many times. Um, and in essence, it was available only to um, scholars who were prepared to visit in person the archive in London. So what we did was um, scanning um, the cards um, contained in the archive, uploading them on Flickr, and then there, there would be uh, an application uh, through which um, members of the public were asked to uh, transcribe the information contained in the cards and transfer it into the fields that you can see um, on the left. And they were also asked to um, georeference the find spots. We have not done this in just in one go, but we have um, broken up the archive in a number of small um, applications because um, by doing this, we, we understood that um, the process was, was much more manageable. And um, once the transcription is complete, um, the records will be merged with the records that are already in the Portable Antiquity Scheme database, which contains um, records that um, pertain to metal artifacts found in England and Wales from the 1990s. So it will create um, one of the biggest, um, actually, uh, archives of its own kind um, that exist and are available online. Alongside this more traditional uh, kind of crowdsourcing transcription, uh, we have also experimented with new kinds um, that have allowed, for example, the um, to 3D print the pole stays and the mini flanged axes that you can see um, in the slide. This application, well, we called it a 3D photo masking um, application. And uh, this is because, well, it's an application that asks members of the public to um, identify the outline of objects on photos, sets of 
40 plus photos taken all around the objects. Um, and this is because mm, in order to create the masks that you see um, uh, up in the slide. Uh, and this process is useful really to improve the quality of 3D models uh, that um, are created using the masked photos offline with um, well, what we used Photoscan um, as software. Um, we've also adapted this application which relies um, essentially on polygon drawing um, and um, for example to one adaptation has been um, the one that you see here um, we have um, basically used polygon drawing to uh, create 3D uh, solid of revolutions of amphoras from an amphoras um, and um, Basically, the, the, um, the from drawings that already existed and were available um, uh, online. All these procedures allow to create um, large quantities of data that, of course, unlock uh, new kinds of quantitative typ typological uh, analysis of artifacts. Um, just to mention um, two other applications that we've developed. These are more about, um, th these are applications that ultimately allow the uh, public indexing of artifact collection, um, the, the one um, uh, at the top, and photographic um, historical uh, photos, um, the one at the, the bottom. Now validation, how do we make sure that the tasks completed online by uh, members of the public um, are actually usable <laughs> for research. This is a very important point, and um, the method that we've been using uh, is a quite established one um, in crowdsourcing. It's based on the principle of redundancy. So every task is completed by um, two to four uh, different collaborators, depending on the, the, the kind of the project um, that uh, we're dealing with. And ultimately, in the case of transcriptions, uh, the um, transcribed data is checked first by uh, an experienced collaborator, and then um, it is also checked finally by the curator um, at the British Museum. With the masks, we started with first merging um, the, um, the polygons that um, were drawn by different collaborators. But then we realized that this um, actually, in the majority of the cases, really lowered the, the quality uh, of the data. Um, and so we prefer to move to just pick the, the, the best mask um, and, and use that. And we found that in the majority of cases, two masks um, for, each, uh, photos, for each photo are enough. All the data mm, that is created is made available um, online um, under um, a Creative Commons license. Provisionally, it is available on a, 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 like a, um, a data center web page that is um, part of the Micropass uh, platform. Um, and this contains both raw um, and derived data, so all the scans, all the photos, but also the transcribed data, um, uh, and um, the, um, basically the, the also the um, what we put up is the transcribed data um, as soon as it is it has been transcribed, and then the consolidated version as well. The, we have really been encouraging institutions to embrace uh, a fully uh, open uh, policy for data release um, because we, we have seen that really um, non-commercial licenses in the end um, are not really worth, <laughs> um, in the majority of cases, uh, the benefits generated by um, restricting commercial use um, are outweighed, um, are, are much less than those that are generated by an open access um, and an open data uh, policy in terms of visibility uh, also of the institution. Now, um, throughout the project, um, we have been um, um, using these platforms to enable different kinds um, of participation. Um, that uh, really move uh, throughout the spectrum from more contributory to more co-creative. And um, 
well, we had a public archaeology research agenda, so we really wanted to know um, more about who was uh, interacting with the platform, the dynamics of um, the volunteer group formation, um, participation mo profile and motivations, and ultimately the value of participation for different individuals um, involved and for uh, the institutions who took part um, in the project. And we used a mixed methodology that relied both on quantitative and qualitative data and methods. Um, and um, we also experimented with the use of some uh, on-platform surveys, um, which were really actually effective, um, much more than the, um, what has usually been done uh, for crowdsourcing, evaluating crowdsourcing, which is end-of-project um, surveys, which actually, um, in the majority of the cases, uh, if not all cases, end up being um, providing very small quantities of data that are not really good to do enough to do a quantitative study, but not rich enough to do a qualitative one. At the contributory level, um, we have been, so basically uh, what I mean by contributory level, uh, simply uh, in terms of um, people helping with the um, submission of tasks through the crowdsourcing platform. We have been in working with about 1,400 uh, volunteers. Uh, even though the majority of the work was really done by a much smaller group uh, of people. And this is a really typical trend uh, in crowdsourcing. You can find it in most mm, of crowdsourcing projects. And is, it is evident um, in the charts that you see uh, at the bottom, which are rank size plots. They uh, basically show the ranking of participants per number of tasks submitted uh, for the photo masking and for the transcription, um, which I'm presenting separate. And the table um, also describes um, the trend um, in, in further detail, it shows that um, really um, only 25% of volunteers completed more than 14 tasks. Um, and here the point um, is really that actually what this means is that there is a small group of people who are really, really involved and this gives um, the institution the opportunity to work with them in a very deep way and has also um, an impact positive impact on the quality of the work that is conducted, on the kind of relationship that can be established with them. And then there is a long tail of people who um, engage in a more serendipitous way, more occasionally, but nonetheless for the institution, even this long tail is very useful to reach, um, for example, new audiences, as I will um, talk about a bit more, and also to maintain links with existing audiences. Um, there had also been a tendency for volunteers to focus mainly on one kind of crowdsourcing activity and uh, here I've compared transcription and photo masking which are the two types that we have been deploying consistently since the beginning and throughout the project. Uh, the majority of people um, have chosen either one or the other or the other kind with less volunteers doing both. And even amongst this latter group of people doing both, most have uh, tried both kinds, but then really went for one. Volunteer choices have been strongly led um, by a preference uh, for those activities requiring skills um, they already had and they felt um, comfortable contributing, with little ch change observed through time. Um, on, the le on the right, um, you can see um, two charts which really show the Lorentz curves and also the Gini coefficient that relate to participation in transcription and photo masking. These are just two measures that are used in the social sciences to assess the degree of inequality uh, of, in, of distributions. The Lorentz curve, the, the, the curve that you see, reveals the cumulative percentage um, of people who have done a certain amount of tasks for the photo masking and for the transcription. The more it is bended, the greater the inequality. So what you can really see is that actually it looks like um, there is great inequality, as we've seen, but um, the masking is slightly more democratizing than the transcription. Um, although, was, although we have seen that this, this tends to be because more people do slightly less of it, um, whereas um, in the transcription there is a group who do slightly more. 
At the co-creative level, we've been working with um, uh, about 80 people um, involving them in forum discussions about how the project, uh, how the platforms should be developed further. And as a result of this conversation, we have also been engaging in a deeper way with um, a small number um, of contributors who are also those more involved in the, co in the contributory kind of participation. Um, and following their own suggestion, we just um, involved them in, we just uh, invited their help in tasks that, uh, and activities that are uh, more at the interface between the creation and the interpretation of data. So for example, um, the consolidation of transcription and the creation of 3D models offline, which now they are doing. This process was supported not only by, by the forum, but also by, um, for example, um, resources that we made available online and um, a research blog. Originally, our aim was to establish collaborations with citizens by engaging uh, both um, a, a ubiquitous and as yet unknown crowd of people online and groups who um, were already established uh, offline. So archaeological and historical societies reaching out to the group of metal detectorists who was working with the portable antiquity scheme um, and who could be interested, for example, in the, um, in, in the crowdsourcing work focusing on metal artifacts. Now, um, we tried involving uh, an online crowd using online publicity and then an offline, uh, offline groups um, with in-person uh, communications, tailored emails and so on. And what we found is that, um, again, the um, online publicity was by far the best method and our efforts in instead to engage offline groups were less successful. As a result of it, we've been um, working with a group of collaborators who's very widespread uh, geographically and um, has almost exclusively an online presence, although some of them have also come to London, helped with photography, spoke at conferences and, and so on. About um, three-fourths um, of the group of people we've been working with do not work in archaeology or um, history um, as part, uh, sorry, they do not work with archaeology or history as part of their main daily job. And this is really important because it means that um, this model we've tried has been successful in establishing collaborations truly between people working in heritage institutions and people who are not working formally for these institutions outside of them. Um, in terms of age, I think um, what we found is that we have a generally younger um, audience um, than uh, most crowdsourcing projects in the humanities and we found the 3D modeling element to be key, um, key uh, in this. So, um, there is a statistically significant relationship between age and the, the kind of um, and, and the preference for um, the photomasking versus the the transcription. And if age is correlated with a slightly different task preference, gender is correlated with a slightly different subject focus. So. Um, like um, micro, for micropasts, um, uh, as for other um, crowdsourcing projects in the humanities, uh, collaborators have been mainly women, uh, which is completely different from the trend that is, has been recorded, for example, by um, science-based um, crowdsourcing pro projects. And although the majority of collaborators come from English-speaking uh, countries, countries where English is the first language. We've also been successful in um, involving people um, and collaborators very deeply who do not uh, come from this country now, for example, from Greece and France. This is because we have some applications like the photomasking um, one, which um, really um, allow the public to work with photos, um, to work with images and less with uh, text. Um, and of course, this has also been um, further, I mean, we're trying progressively to, to translate, to, to make this platform multilingual. Why are people contributing? Um, what motivations are they seek seeking satisfaction for through this kind of participation that I've described? Um, well, 
I think um, there, there is, of course, uh, plenty of literature that looks at volunteer uh, motivations, um, that looks at the um, uh, altruistic, egoistic, intrinsic, extrinsic dualities. But here, I think it is useful to really identify three main groups of uh, motivations. A first group um, uh, consists of motivations that um, recur and can be um, found also in relation to museum visitation more generally. So um, there is, um, um, for example, interest in learning, getting a training, learning opportunity for themselves, but also for their family and friends. So we've had collaborators downloading um, some of the cards, downloading some of the photos and giving them to their children who took them to school. And this started actually for example, um, school activity around um, the British Bronze Age in countries as far as India, uh, um, we have um, heard. Um, or um, um, relaxation, having a gaming uh, experience, particularly in relation to the photo masking, which sometimes is just used to continue helping out, but uh, in, a, in a lighter um, way, less uh, intense um, way than uh, through transcription. The aesthetic pleasure of uh, looking at the cards, looking at the calligraphy that is used, looking at the drawings, um, and um, actually have the possibility to experience and learn more about the feature of the object while drawing uh, the, the outline of the object, looking at it close up. Then there is a, mo a category of motivations that uh, is shared by several uh, crowdsourcing projects. Um, the social motivations of helping out, um, generosity, giving back, um, we found, to uh, an institution, particularly the British Museum, um, who some of our collab collaborators um, visited in the past. Um, then they went back to their countries, Australia, Canada, for example, um, and they saw the project, the possibility of participating in the project online, and felt, well, um, I could visit um, this museum. I had a great experience. Now I want to give something back to it, so I'm going to help um, with this project. Um, making valuable use of, of their own knowledge and skill uh, and skills and having them acknowledged was a really important motivation for others. Advancing scientific knowledge and here I should say that um, the applications that are related to a research agenda have much more traction because people actually really feel that they're contributing to advanced knowledge. The more pop-up ones are fun to do, but um, the, the smaller experiment um, we've seen have generally been less exciting for our more involved collaborators. Competition um, is an aspect, is a motivation uh, for quite a few of them, but only in one case, I would say, it has reached um, a level that has actually lowered the, the quality of the work that was conducted. And this required um, a discussion on the forum about what to do uh, with, for example, the leaderboard, deleting it, taking it out or not, because other collaborators were feeling that actually their work um, wasn't, um, well, was less valued if there were people who, in order to escalate a leaderboard, were submitting worst, um, worst tasks. And this point I'm mentioning in particular to show how closely related the public engagement methods um, are with the archaeological science methods. Because eventually, to control, um, we cannot essentially and do not want to um, block users. So in order to control, um, essentially only one case um, where this competition uh, had led to uh, very um, posi well, possibly not, not positive um, results, we had to, to slightly change our redundancy and raise it from two to three um, so that there would be in any case enough um, tasks submitted uh, to choose from uh, to guarantee the quality, uh, the necessary quality of data. So there is a huge link between this between the public engagement and the archaeological science um, aspects. Uh, a final category um, 
that, um, well, it's not only uh, specific to archaeology or history, but um, I think it's particularly relevant uh, to these fields. Um, sorry, includes um, one, uh, sorry, a final category includes um, a motivation that I don't think is mm, specific of archaeology and history only necessarily, but is very relevant in these fields. And it's the fact of having the possibility to maintain a, collect, a connection with um, a field of study that had been in fact studied, for example, uh, during university, um, but had not become a career uh, for some of these collaborators for different reasons, for personal reasons, for job market related reasons. And now they could go back to it and um, in, in a couple of cases build skills that could enrich their um, CVs and actually help them to get a job finally in this field. Um, so um, what has been the value, not of the project, but I think what could be argued as being the value of the model that is embraced. What well, it allowed um, nearly finishing um, in a year and a half the sourcing of uh, an archive that contains 30,000 um, records. Um, and uh, to build a number of other resources such as 3D models and importantly um, to build um, applications, crowdsourcing applications that are, um, can be adapted, are modular. So we, with small adjustments, they can be adapted to be used in different kinds, uh, for different kinds of archaeological research, with different kinds of um, collections, as I've also uh, tried to show. Um, and they have fueled uh, new research projects. Um, here, I would like to bring in very uh, briefly just the point of um, the ethical point. So, what about this labor? Um, <laughs> some people say, I mean, is, it, is there um, an element of exploiting people? Well, um, we, I mean, I personally don't feel um, that there is just because of how the practice of um, working with our uh, collaborators have been very close up, um, very um, participatory, very inclusive. Um, constant dialogue and uh, checking and resolving um, of problems. And in terms of employment, um, I will also speak more of this, but uh, in some of the new research projects that um, we are proposing and that would be based, uh, would be using the crowdsourced data or new uh, or data that will be um, crowdsourced, we are trying to include also in, in paid positions some of the more involved. Uh, collaborators who have, who have helped so far. Institutional value. There has been um, value uh, for institutions in terms of uh, maintaining links with existing audiences, as, as I was um, highlighting, and also um, value in uh, connecting with, um, in some cases, new and younger um, audiences. There has been value in terms of visibility um, for uh, the, the institutions participating as well, and um, particularly through networks of uh, bigger and smaller institutions with uh, greater or um, less great um, capacity in terms of staff and resources. Social value, um, as I was mentioning, skill building, um, not only for the collaborators, also for the team, because we, well, I mean, we have included also uh, the, the more involved collaborators effectively in the team, the part, the part of it. And for us, because we have um, more and more, well, we have built almost all of the resources in-house, and we've been progressively um, doing more so. So learning also um, from uh, like a, <clears throat> a technical point of view. Um, and uh, again, uh, knowledge gained, acknowledgement of knowledge and uh, skills gained, uh, employment uh, in a couple of cases uh, through skill building, resulting also, also from the project. Um, I mean, and this was uh, something that was reported uh, to us. So. Um, and finally, the possibility of um, really finding a space um, where it is possible to discuss for them some of the interests that these collaborators have, which are quite, uh, in some cases, specific, like 3D modeling, 
for example. And at the same time, the possibility to engage in a deeper uh, and individual way with collections. Um, often um, in the museum space, um, the experiences tend to be uh, directly social. So um, many people go with their families, they go with their friends, they share. This is a, a the, the crowdsourcing experience um, is a very different one in this sense because it also allows, while allowing um, the connection with other people through the forum and different means, it also allows a very focused engagement with artifacts and with archives. Now, in order to really speak of value of the model, um, I think it is key um, to make sure that it it is actually repeatable, it is scalable, it is to some extent sustainable, so beyond um, a, what is a grant a grant um, a grant funded period. And in fact, um, sustainability of this project is potentially the greatest uh, weakness of all. Um, what I mean where I see um, repeatability, um, I mean, how do I see um, repeatability, repeatability and scalability ensured um, in relation to crowdsourcing is really um, by having fewer uh, multi-project uh, platforms that really involve uh, a higher number of institutions rather than having each institution um, going uh, on its own with its own platform and therefore having greater sustainability project, having to reinvest um, money in actually building the resources from scratch. Um, so, for example, um, what the project is really trying to do is to, um, and has partly done uh, already so far, is to involve new museums, new archives, um, and um, just uh, offer the platform so that they can then um, do the digitization work at their hand, for example, um, scanning um, a number um, of um, uh, card uh, archives that they have or take photos of number of objects. And then we would deploy um, the, the application or at least to start with a pop-up application. Scalability um, is something that is um, facilitated very much um, together with repeatability actually by the um, open source nature of the software that we've used. The possibility to adapt easily these uh, applications with not so much, uh, not so great uh, effort. Um, and so, I mean, the, the, um, the the final point with which um, uh, I would like to conclude is really to, um, I mean, invite any comments that uh, you might have and um, in relation to the model, uh, this model that I've presented and um, stress again, um, really, um, the, the potential um, of um, using a public archaeology model that um, tightly, tightly weaves in um, uh, on the one end, uh, archaeological research and public engagement uh, on the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. I think it was a very inspiring uh, talk and I'm pretty sure that it's, this model hasn't been explored in the Mexican community, so it's really encouraging. It's really important to encourage our community to start like thinking the possibilities. Y, bueno, queremos abrir la conversación. Eh, no sé si tienen algunas preguntas o algún comentario para Kiara en, en este punto. Yeah, hi. Uh, sí. Ah, um, I just uh, wanted you to, you have some comments about the policy and institutional environment. Uh, maybe you can make some comparison between what is happening in Italy and the UK. Mm -hmm. Because we need, uh, uh, you are doing this work in a university, right? Which yeah. uh, has different legal setting. Mm -hmm. um, we work in INA, in a, like can be, like something like can be a governmental agency and we have a lot of restrictions about getting money, donations, things like that. So that makes our work a little more constrained in terms of crowd 
funding, for example. So could you have any comments what happened in Italy and the UK yeah. in this regard? Yes. Um, um, you mean in relation to the crowdsourcing and the crowdfunding separately, both of them? The, the crowdfunding, yeah. Um, well, um, I, I will actually start with just a note on the crowdsourcing. Uh, to say that um, in terms of um, like Creative Commons licensing and uh, having the data released fully open, um, some institutions um, in the UK are um, fine about it, like the British Museum, with others, um, we have struggled a little bit more. I think our, our, um, where we cut off is like the non-commercial, like in, in some cases, um, if the institution really wants to go for the non-commercial non license, we um, allow that, um, but uh, we don't encourage it basically. Um, and in Italy, um, I'm actually, um, uh, I'm now discussing um, new collaborations with one national museum, and they would be prepared to go for a fully open, um, fully open um, policy in terms of data release. Um, I'm sure there will be plenty other cases who, who would not. So it takes a little bit also of like um, dialogue and exploration on both parts of advantages and disadvantages. For the crowdfunding, um, very true actually, uh, the point that I made at the beginning on um, the importance of the policy context is very relevant uh, to that because uh, crowdfunding tends to have much more appeal um, and to work better um, in countries that um, like invite um, and welcome very much also private um, donations have this philanthropy um, culture. Um, there are um, and there are experiments <laughs> in Italy that are uh, popping up. Uh, there is one in particular um, called uh, I Love Italy that um, is just now launching uh, the platform, and they're trying to basically use crowdfunding for the preservation um, of heritage. I mean, I know that um, there are more in relation to the crowdfunding. There can be um, potentially more issues related to the routing of the funding. Maybe a way um, is, I don't, I don't know if it would work, it, it, it can work in some cases in Italy, is to um, have the crowdfunding um, uh, platform collecting the donation and then transferring it as a one donation to the institution. If I don't know if it would be a way around it, but like, rather than so basically, there is a charity. There is a charity. There is a, a charity, um, a group who collects everything through the platform, and then and then the money is like in one go, uh, as a one donation transferred. Yeah. Ah, sorry, but um, it wasn't straightforward even uh, for the university to do it. I, I have to say, even in the UK, I mean, we had to go. Um, it, it requires a lot of um, discussion. Um, it required for us also a lot of discussion around legal, legal, you know, the, the, the legal terms and, um, yeah. Thank you very much, Chiara. It's a very interesting presentation. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first relates to uh, something you alluded to at the end of the presentation around the sustainability of the project mm -hmm. and some of the challenges the project might face in that area. Um, so my question is um, maybe most focused on the kinds of uh, software that you developed and your, your choice to use open uh, source software, but also the use of um, uh, corporate or sort of commercial platforms like Flickr um, mm -hmm. or even Google Maps and so on. And I'm wondering about, uh, so did I see some Google Maps in there? Some, I think some use sort of geotagging and, and, and so on. Anyway. We use open layers, yes, for oh. the georeferencing and okay. yes. Okay, so I guess my question is just about um, some of the challenges around using tools that are so helpful and work so well in, in collaboration uh, or in cooperation with open source platforms, uh, but the challenge of uh, sort of trusting them to maintain data or ma maintain connections with your system into the future. Um, so that's one part of it. How, yeah. do you, how do you keep it and how can you ensure that it will be there in the future? And then the second question, um, 
has to do with um, the sort of shifting sense of uh, the expert or the, the curator and the, the, the institution as a um, kind of pinnacle of expertise around collections. And um, in crowdsourcing, uh, and in this kind of project, do you, do you see um, the kinds of information that you're soliciting uh, challenging or uh, throwing into question the expertise of the curators ultimately, or is it information that assists the institution in kind of maintaining that role? So um, what, yeah. what is your sense of, of that shift potentially? Thank you. Um, the first question, um, yes, we wouldn't expect uh, systems to remain the same over time. And in fact, something that um, um, we are trying to do um, and we have tried to do is to build um, in-house in expertise um, so that we are able to um, make changes to the platform and uh, recode um, part of it if needed in order to respond uh, to change with um, um, as little as possible help um, from the outside, basically. So this is one thing. Um, and um, to the um, moving to the second to the second question, um, I think well, um, what the ones that I've presented um, are tasks that assist um, on um, basically the, the completion of projects that have um, a specific research aim, um, and um, they are not. Um, um, crowdsourcing applications that, for example, um, work towards the to wor work towards co-curating collections, which is something that actually I would like to do, but not more. Um, I would say uh, more in relation to the built environment and my work um, in relation to that in future. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, they I would argue that they have to work towards shift in any way this idea of like a, mm, uh, of shifting authority within the museum because even um, um, we have involved them uh, we have involved collaborators uh, also in the consolidation of the data so they had to check it um, they had to check several information on their own uh, using Google and doing research uh, about them because it wasn't straightforward for example uh, they had to recheck quite a few of the the, the, the site location, the find spot locations, and um, and in the end, they had a, quite a big role in the final consolidation of the data, which at the beginning for the museums was a bit not not always um, something they felt comfortable with, and, and then they did, and um, you know it's something that we we've, we've had and they've had to justify also at conferences and so on, but it, in the end it worked because then there is there was um, a second check that really, um, through which we found that what they had done was good work. I mean, yeah. Um, so in a way, um, it is, um, um, we haven't yet embraced these methods for a full co-curation, um, but there is still, um, I think, um, th th there has been discussion around authority, nevertheless, even though the tasks have been more uh, contributory, yeah, in kind. Thank you very much, Thank Chiara. You.